Thank you all so much. If you are new here at the church at Station Hill, I am not John Joseph. Um, he has much better hair, strong jaw. Uh, my name is David Hanna. I come to you bringing greetings from your sister church up in wild, weird, wonderful East Nashville, the church at Lachlan Springs. My family loves it up there. I love it up there. It is different. Not, not just culturally. Our, our church itself just is different. For example, so this section right here, right now, that's our church. It's who we are. There's a, there's a beauty. There's an intimacy. There's a, a communal nature to it. We have, we have one service, not three services. I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about that. There are people in the room and the worship team that were here at the eight o'clock this morning. I, I would ask you, you laugh at my jokes as much now as you did. You know, the gasps and amens, please. Luke, when you cried and rededicated your life to Christ, that was beautiful. <laughs> Um, if we could just kind of play that back, that would be great. Um, like many of you, my favorite book in the Bible, or one of my favorite, is Paul's letter to the church at Rome. One of the things I love about Romans is that it's the only letter Paul wrote to a church that he did not know. It wasn't the church at Corinth, or the church at Philippi, or the church at Ephesus. It wasn't a church he planted, or lived for a couple of years and taught and helped grow and helped lead. He did not know the people in the church at Rome, yet he was able to write to them on a foundation of love and commonality and connection through the gospel. This morning, I am so grateful that I get to stand here on the foundation of love and intimacy, commonality and connection through the gospel. And we as a church family have those incredible connections. This year, may be feeling them more than any other because I know every morning when I wake up and I open my Bible, there are thousands of people across Middle Tennessee, open that exact same passage. People in Spring Hill, people in Thompson Station, reading along God's word with me. And there is a power in that that frankly, I've never experienced before. It has been un to see that bring our church family together. If you have been reading along that Bible reading plan with the rest of us, late this past week, you began to dip your toes into the book of Numbers. It's where we're going to find our morning. Now, Numbers, it's the, it's the fourth book of the Torah. It's kind of the forgotten book almost. It doesn't have the cachet, kind of those white hot stories of Genesis and Exodus with the creation narrative and Noah and Abraham, Jacob and Joseph and the 10 plagues and the Exodus itself, God saving his people from captivity in Egypt and the Red Sea. It doesn't even have that fear factor that Leviticus does. You know, Leviticus is one of the books that comes up when you enter into a Bible reading plan because there's that, there's that trepidation. Am I going to be able to make it through Leviticus, through these laws, through the sacrifice, the blood, so much blood. And then you get to numbers. Of, eh. Kind of what really is it? What does that title even mean? And you enter into it and it starts with a bunch of numbers. This kind of accounting, this census of God's people as they camped there at Mount Sinai and you go into the organization of the way 
camp and these rules and regulations of purity and holiness and it can seem a little technical and a little tedious when you pull back Those first few chapters, there is an incredible beauty in them because what you see painted in that organization, it is organization out of chaos. It also is a picture of God's presence, literally and physically, but also spiritually in the center of his people and the things they must to exist in such close proximity to God's presence. Did you know that the Hebrew title for the book of Numbers, when translated into English, is In the Wilderness? We get our our English book of Numbers from the Greek, But in Hebrew, it's called in the wilderness. Could you imagine if you were looking down the table of contents of your Bible and you saw books of the Bible like Job and Psalms and Habakkuk. And in the middle of that long list, there was a book called wilderness. It's probably the first place you would go. It's certainly the first place I would go. It sounds like a Jack Kerouac novel. It sounds like uh, an adventure story. It sounds like some sort of travel log. And the reality is the book of Numbers is kind of all of those things wrapped up together. The powerful story, the powerful story, the heartbreaking story sometimes of God's people traveling in the wilderness for nearly four decades on their way to the promised. This morning, as we enter into the book of Numbers, we are going to do so in Numbers chapter nine. If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to turn with me there to Numbers chapter nine. I'm gonna begin in verse 15. If you are able, I would love for you to as we read God's word. Numbers chapter nine, beginning in verse 15. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of testimony, and it appeared like fire from evening until morning. It remained that way continuously. The cloud would cover it, appearing like a fire at night. Whenever the cloud was lifted above the tent, the Israelites would set out at the place where the cloud stopped, where there there the Israelites camped. At the Lord's, the Israelites set out and and at the Lord's command they camped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they camped. Even when the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, many days the Israelites carried out the Lord's requirement and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud remained over the tabernacle. A few days, they would camp at the Lord's command and set out at the Lord's command. Sometimes the cloud remained only from evening until morning. When the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it remained day and a night, they moved cloud lifted, whether it was two days, a month, or even longer, the Israelites camped and did not set out as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle. But when it was lifted, they set out. They camped at the Lord's command. At the Lord's command, they carried out the Lord's requirement according to his command through Moses. I'm going to say the word of the Lord. You say, thanks be to God. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So what? Here in the second half of the ninth chapter of the book of Numbers is not necessarily a picture of something that was going on as much as a description of what it looked like for God's people as they walked through the wilderness toward the promised land. You see, what we have in Numbers 9 is almost the exact picture that closes the book of Exodus. The last verses of Exodus 40 paint this exact picture. It was when Moses found himself outside 
outside of the presence of God and a cloud descended upon the tabernacle. And that cloud represented God's presence in that place. And then we see at the end of Exodus, when the cloud lifted and moved, they went. When the cloud stayed, they stayed a little more detail as to what that looked like because you see in the next chapter in Numbers 10, that's when the journey begins. This is, this is the classic Southern getting ready to go. They're fixing to go somewhere. And we see what the journey is going to look like. The cloud representing the presence of God descends upon the tabernacle. It's God's presence in the center of his people. When the cloud moves, they move. When the cloud stays, they stay. It's the simplest formula in the world. When God moves, we move. When God stays, we stay. Yet it is one of the most difficult things that we can do. You see, the the opposite of simple is not difficult. The opposite of, of simple is complicated. There's nothing at all complicated about this. When God moves, we move. When God stays, we stay. There is something incredibly difficult because in doing so, what we do is release control. Release control of when we're going. Release control of when we're staying. Release control of where we're going. And it is in that release of control we find things so hard because we white knuckle so much because we know better, right? Right? When we're going, where we're going, when we're staying, why we're staying. No, that doesn't make sense. I've got a better idea. And God, I'll I'll meet you when I get there. It's also so difficult, this picture painted in, in Numbers 9 of God's people, that they didn't know when they were going to go and when they were going to stay. Maybe we'll be here a month. Maybe we'll be here till tomorrow morning. It makes Difficult to be where you are. It makes it so difficult to plant roots. It defies all human logic. My wife and I spent about nine years on the mission field. It takes a lot of preparation to, to pull up stakes and go to a us, like many others going on the mission field, a part of that preparation was the visa process the bureaucracy that allows you to enter into and live in a foreign land. We had just had a baby, tiny, a couple of months old. Incredible celebration for us, but it did cause a wrinkle in the visa process because we were getting work visas. It was hard to justify a work visa for a two-month-old. So we talked to the consulate, consulate says, no problem at all. You get your work visas and then you call us family visa so that you can bring her along with you. The work visa is going to be the difficult part. The family visa is super easy. They told us our work visa may take quite a bit of time. It took us less than a week. God moved mountains. It was a miraculous process. We were ready to go. We bought our plane tickets. We put it on a boat. We shipped it over to Europe hey guys, we've got our work visas. Could you go ahead and send us that family visa so we can bring our daughter with us? Absolutely. It's gonna take a few days. We had all of our big going away parties. And then two days before our plane was to leave, the visa still hasn't arrived and we get a call from the consulate. We are so sorry. There's been a little delay. It's been caught up in some of the bureaucracy. It may still be a couple of weeks before it's gonna come. So we had to cancel that trip. And now here we are in Nashville. We've already stuff. We've already had our goodbye parties. And you know how when you go to dinner with somebody and the meal ends and you say your goodbyes and it's kind of that emotional moment and then you leave the restaurant and you're parked in the same place. <laughs> and you kind of have to have that real awkward walk and you don't know what to do. That life 
in Nashville. So we decided let's go down to Atlanta where my parents live, let them spend a couple of weeks with their brand new baby granddaughter and then we'll go. Well, a couple of weeks turned into a month. Then another month and then another month. Finally, six months had passed and we were still there. Our stuff was still across the ocean. We were still living in a spare bedroom in my parents' house. The worst part about it was every week we talked to the consulate and every week, next week. Your visa's gonna be here next week, which meant every day for what ended up being almost seven months, we had to live as though a couple of days from now we're going to live in a foreign country. We never even unpacked our suitcases. Because why, right? Tomorrow, we're probably gonna zip them up and get on a plane and move to a foreign land. We ended up leaving in February. We had flip-flops and t-shirts on. Because it's all we had packed. Clothes were already where we were going. It was almost impossible to stay there not knowing. It was almost impossible to be ready every day and be disappointed every night. I back at that season now and you can see all of the ways God moved in our life. During this season of staying, you can see the relationships that were formed and matured relationships we still have today. I have six months worth of pictures of my father with his granddaughter, not knowing that a couple of years later he would pass away from cancer. God exactly where we needed to be. We were convinced it was somewhere else. It is so hard, yet so simple. When he moves, we move. When he stays, we stay. Even when it is incredibly inconvenient. Those of you that have been walking through this Bible reading plan, you, you remember chapter after chapter after chapter in the second half of Exodus, as we're, we're told about the intricacies of the tabernacle that will be the presence of God and, and the curtains and the way it's all put together. In minute, perfect, beautiful detail, in the first chapters of the book of Numbers, we see how God's people, the Israelites, were told to camp. It was very ordered, specific. When the cloud moves, you move. It's not as simple as, okay, I'm just gonna start walking that direction. No, 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 no. They had to take down their tents every single time the cloud moved. And sometimes they had just put up their tents. And, and these were not the tents that you're gonna get at Cumberland Transit with the cool fiberglass poles that just kind of pop up themselves. These were exceedingly difficult to put up and take down, not even considering the priests that had to tear down the tabernacle every time the cloud moved, put it back together, rebuild it every time the cloud stopped. If you've ever built Ikea furniture and you've had to take it down to fit it in the back of your tercel and you Together at your new location. It never goes together the same way twice. Every single time. When he moved, they moved. When he stayed, they stayed. Even when it was incredibly inconvenient, God has sense to move right now. Let's, let's just wait until the kids are out of school then it's going to be a lot easier. I'm gonna have much more margin. I've got things to do right now. I'm up for a big promotion, God. 
I'm going to put in a couple of more years and then everything's going to be set. But right now, my retirement isn't quite as full as I want it to be. There is always to not move when God moves. There is always a reason to not stay when God stays. Yeah, but, but, but God, I, I know you want me here right now, but this job, over the best schools are down there. Here, I, it just doesn't make any sense to stay here. When he moves, we move. When he stays, he stays. We stay even when it is convenient, even when he goes where we do not want him to. You should, shouldn't we have taken a left back there, God? You know, the grass is way, way greener on that direction, but are we going here? That doesn't make any sense. You see, what we do instead of moving at God's pace is we run out ahead of him. We, we know in general where he's going, right? We know in general what he wants to do, right? Go on ahead, I'll let you know when I get there. After all, there are all these things in the world that you don't seem to be taking care of. There are all these issues that aren't I think they should turn out. So I'm going to go fight those battles for you. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, omnipotent omniscient, omnipresent, does not need you to defend him, does not need you to fight his battles. You were outside the tabernacle, outside since he made a way for you to enter into his presence. When he moves, we move. When he stays, we stay. There are those of you this morning thinking, yes, I realize that's difficult, but it would be way easier if there was just a giant cloud in my front yard. You know, if I could just see God's presence, a pillar of flame at night is hard to ignore. When it goes somewhere, I'll follow. Even when I don't want to, even when I don't like it, because I can't deny it, but God doesn't give me that anymore. Now, what do I follow? One of my favorite passages in the scripture is found in chapter five. Jesus has just healed someone on the Sabbath. It's a big no-no. And breaking the Old Testament law according to the Pharisees, you rest on the Sabbath. You certainly don't heal the Sabbath. So Jesus is engaging in this conversation with the Pharisees, those religious elite, those people that had dedicated their entire lives to the law, their entire lives to interpreting the law, their entire lives to practicing their law, the law, and their entire lives to making sure everyone else practiced the law exactly. They practiced the law. It was their whole personality. And in John chapter five, verse 39, Jesus talking to the Pharisees says, you spend all of your energy every single day pouring over the scriptures, pouring over the law, but you're missing it. You're looking in those pages for righteousness. You're looking in those pages for eternal life. What I'm trying to tell you, those pages point to righteousness and eternal life, and it's me. 
I'm the one you're looking for. We do not have a giant pillar of cloud in our front yard. If you do, call me. But we already know who it is we follow. We've sung it this morning, right? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Many of us self-identify as a Christ follower. We say that all the time. We say that regularly, but are we really? Over 20 times in the gospels, Jesus says the words, follow me. Oftentimes, it's to an individual. You know, hey, Levi, hop up out of that tax collector booth. Come follow me. Sometimes Jesus adds a little detail to these individuals because he knows exactly what it is that, that's holding them back. Hey, rich young ruler, I know you want to follow me, but the problem is you're married to your stuff. It's your stuff that's, that's anchoring you. It's, the stuff, it's your stuff that's keeping you back. So that's what you need to get rid of. Get rid of all your stuff, give it to the poor and follow me. Or, or you are so anchored in the past, escape it and it's going to bury you. Let the dead bury their own and follow me. Perhaps my favorite is the last thing Jesus says in the Gospels. It's the last red letters in the Gospels. It's the very end of the Gospel of John. And Peter, in like full Peter mode, says, hey, hey, Jesus, what, what about that dude? What about John? What's going to happen to him? What's your plan? Is it better than mine? It's better than mine, isn't it? And Jesus looks at him and says, buddy, take a breath. Keep your eyes on your own page and follow me. Of those 20 plus times Jesus calls people to follow him, five of those times, he is kind enough to give us the detailed practical application of what that looks like. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what, what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world, yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? Take up your cross and follow me. It is one of those phrases that is so common, it has miraculously become a part of the modern English vernacular. You know, we all have our cross to bear, right? We hear that all the time. It comes from this. It comes from this idea. Twice in Luke, twice in Matthew, once in Mark, take up your cross and follow me. I have my cross to bear. The very demanding job that fills my calendar. I have some ongoing health issues that make things difficult in my life. I have a lot of childhood trauma that I'm carrying with me. Everybody has their cross to bear. When we say that, we are so often talking about a hurdle to overcome that we carry an inconvenience. Let me tell you, 2,000 years ago in the ancient Near East, anyone that heard Jesus say, take up your cross and follow me, they would not have considered carrying a burden. They would not have considered 
inconvenient and difficult because carrying a cross meant one thing and one thing only, death. Excruciating, humiliating death. What does it look like to follow Jesus? Like constant daily death to ourselves. Laying everything down when he moves, we move. When he stays, we stay regardless. That, that I have convinced myself is better. That thing I have convinced myself makes more sense. That thing I have convinced myself will give me life. After all, Jesus came to provide life abundant, right? That's a verse we stand on. Right here in the 16th chapter of Matthew, he tells you how to gain that life. And it is through death. Luke, as he led us this morning, talked about a slow obedience better than no obedience. And it's so beautiful and I'm so grateful for his words. Eugene Peterson once wrote a book that I would highly recommend. Discipleship book, long obedience in one direction. It is not one obedience. That moment we say that prayer, it's over. I have followed Jesus yesterday. What about today? What about next week? What about when it's really difficult? It is a long obedience in one direction. And a place, it is a person. This week, as you continue to walk into the book of Numbers, this week, as you see God's people, fighting and complaining the whole way, getting up every time that cloud, putting down stakes every time that cloud stops, only because they so desperately desire to be in the presence of God. Ask yourself, what is that thing that keeps me that daily long obedience of death to self so that I might gain life. And it's that that we will pray and meditate over as we close this morning. Lord, we are humbled and we are amazed by your presence with us in this place. Grateful that your presence is no longer relegated a tent or a temple. But fills every fiber of our being. This morning, we boldly ask to us that thing, those things that we so desperately grip that are holding us back from taking up our cross following you entering in to that life that you have created for us we pray these things in your name amen